Welcome everyone. Great you all here. Great you all attending my session. It's interesting that the camera is here. Like, hi. Oh. <laughs> place. Okay, I'm being better to stand here. Okay. Welcome everyone in this session, the last session of the day. I hope you all had a wonderful day and I hope this will be a worthwhile ending. I'll try to make it a worthwhile ending at least. Um, I'm Frank, uh, I work as assistant professor at the Dundas Institute, which is a neuroscience institute. I'm also a neuroscientist by training. My PhD was really fundamental neuroscience. And actually I'm back at university now for a year and I'm trying to connect neuroscience, education and artificial intelligence. I'm actually in the artificial intelligence department. So I also design uh, games and apps and try to model how our brain works for learning. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk about a perspective on learning. And this is very much work in progress. As I said, I'm just back for a year. So some patience. Um, this is a paper I'm writing at the moment. And it's basic, basically trying to formulate a perspective on education um, from the perspective of, neuro of neuroscience, um, not necessarily saying or stating that that's a unique perspective, but that it does unique predictions, but at least gives us a perspective that can help us understand what neuroscience could add. And a lot of neuroscience, uh, there are a lot of neuro myths, and I have been in a few sessions which were actually about neuro myths. Um, and my session will be full of disclaimers. And I still like this spot, so sorry, camera. Uh, um, and I think that's also, uh, that should also be the case if you're talking about neuroscience, as I will be talking about in a second. Okay, um, and I'll try to squeeze it in 40 minutes. Okay, let's get started. So this picture actually summarizes what I will be talking about quite well. If we're talking about education, what we're basically at least trying to do as teachers, and of course also teaching myself, is that you want to align both the passions of a student and what they need to learn. And aligning means that they're not torn apart in two, like in this image, but actually that they go in the same direction. And um, so on the one hand, we have what we want to teach our, our, our children, our, our students, uh, and what we do in often situations like this. And on the other hand, we have the, the engaging experience students might look for themselves, like, I don't know, doing something like this, or actually uh, playing computer games, or anything else they like. And ideally, we would align those two. So our learning experiences would be just, so, uh, just as engaging as this, or just as engaging as a game. And I'm not saying it adds any truth to the statement, but still, it's a nice uh, citation. Experience is the teacher of all things. And to some extent, that's true. At least experience teaches us a lot of things. And that can be experiences in a classroom like here, or experiences outside, or any experience in between. And what I want to kind of see during this talk is, OK, how can we learn from normal experiences and get it into the classroom? And the other way around, how can we actually make normal, that's like everyday experiences, or special experiences, actually educative? Uh, and that's called the field of learning experience design. It's basically instructional design with a twist. Um, with an explicit focus on the experience of the individual student, of the individual learner. It's basically not a scientific field yet, I think. At least there are not very many papers on it. It's actually founded by a, a designer in Utrecht from the Arts Academy who thought, okay, we should think more about the experience of students rather than the instruction. Um, it's a nuanced difference, but to some extent maybe an important difference. Okay, so we're going to try to connect these two. And as inspiration for this side, for the experiences, I take inspiration from games. 
so there will be quite a bit of gamification in the talk, uh, as that is one thing which actually engages our students for sure. And games are, by essence, built to engage people. That's close to, to their raison d'etre, uh, um, to just make you play. On the other side, talking about how you process information and how you learn, that will be the, the neuroscience side, the cognitive neuroscience side. Well, we'll be talking about the brain and a bit about how the brain works. And there I'll start from a, a neuroeducation perspective, which is summarized by this sticker, which basically combines neuroscience, pedagogy, and psychology, and is a field which is booming but also overhyped. <laughs> to be honest, yes. Um, and it's also a really hard field. Because if you see what those three fields uh, encompass, it's like going from the brain, from physical structures, to behavior, to classroom settings. There are quite some leaps you require, especially to get from this to that one. To come, to come from the brain to behavior is already hard enough, I can tell you, based on my PhD. Um, and going from behavior to the classroom is already hard, let alone doing claims based on neuroscience evidence for the full classroom. So, also the goal of my position at university is basically a hard one. Um, because doing unique contributions from the neuroscience perspective to the classroom is a really big leap. You almost by definition will have to behave in between. So in that sense we can add a foundation and add understanding, and that might be a bit of what I will be doing today, uh, but doing new predictions, there are hardly any out there. Most neuroscience claims you see is you have to eat well, you have to sleep well, all those things we already knew. Not adding much. So you could think also to understand, or if you see neuroscience claims, um, you can actually categorize them in, for example, this way. So if you think about neuroscience, it's often about cognitive neuroscience, which is a combination of cognitive psychology and neuroscience. So it has already a component of psychology in there. So most of the neuroscience is a strong behavioral component. On the other hand, you have uh, a distinction between whether it's based on hard data or it's only an interpretation. And most of the things you see are on interpretation. And if you go to the four quadrants we now have, this is basically the bridge you would, wa would want. Really cognitive neuroscience findings which are actually translating hard data on behavioral change. Because we want to see I don't know, better motivation, better scores for students. That's, that's the holy grail. It's not our blobs and the, like, I don't know, yay, the hippocampus lights up. That doesn't tell us anything. It will always have to be related to behavior, otherwise we don't know anything. And in that corner, there's hardly anything really connecting uh, to the behavior or to the, in the, in the classroom setting. The only things that do work is you have some neural enhancers like taking pills and uh, putting some batteries on your brain for transcranial magnetic stimulation, where there are some findings that, that there is some effect. But that's probably not the link we would like. Though some people on YouTube don't do it. With old people with batteries on their head. Weird people. Okay, so there's hardly anything out there. Another thing which you might, what at least we aim for, but is still uh, very much in process, is actually to getting deeper insight in the black box. Because if we indeed can use hard neuroscientific data to see how you learn, that might help us, and also you as teachers, to better understand what happens. To give an example, just last, I think last Monday, yes, I submitted a grant proposal to work with Malberg to combine our knowledge on how, you, how the brain processes words, so how the mental lexicon works, and use their data of, on all the mistakes that students make when learning words, and based, and based on that, build a model of the mental lexicon, so how it works in your brain. And based on that, predict errors students make, and give tailored feedback. But again, that's a grant proposal. That are not published findings yet. <laughs> Far from it. <laughs> um, but that could be something that we can indeed say, okay, we can uh, look deeper than you could normally do. And it could either be with such a model as we would, as we would build, or with real neuroscientific data. But that's all still really, Really young. There's not much out there yet. Okay, then you go here and you come to the easier side. Now you're just interpreting results and, and starting from there. So, for example, uh, one finding uh, one of my PhD students is working on 
in the brain, we know that, that words are roughly sorted by similarity. So if you're learning vocabulary, word, words are sorted by how similar they are in the brain. And it is across languages. So that's in English and German, it's all mixed. Okay, and we know that concepts are also stored based on similarity in the brain. So we basically designed a, a version of memory, the classic game memory, where the cards are sorted based on similarity. And are now going to test okay, that's actually helpful learning. But that's like really taking some neuroscientific evidence, taking the interpretation from the data, so the data's there, and we take the interpretation and trying that in practice to try to get to a behavioral result. Again, there's not much out there, but it's at least a way to use neuroscience data. Um, and the last one is, is based on the behavior and the, uh, the interpretation. And that is often a learning, a, a perspective on how we learn. That's, for example, the, the easy claims about uh, you have to eat well and you have to uh, use multiple modalities and what else. Um, and there it is often only a, another, re an, another reason to do something we already did. Not adding something new specifically, but at least it's a different way, potentially a different way of thinking, which might be beneficial both for teachers and for us as scientists to think of new questions. And here I'm mostly going to, I'm actually going to talk only about this corner. So a learning perspective. A perspective on learning from a neuroscience, and in this case, a gamification perspective. Which might shine a, a different light than you would normally think of on how education works. Yeah? Okay. So, any questions about this first part? No? Otherwise, my disclaimer is coming. Okay, disclaimer. Um, first disclaimer, I'm not saying I make unique predictions with those th these statements. Uh, actually, what I'm now doing in the paper I'm writing is I'm, for each of the things I'm saying, I'm basically relating it back to education science. As that's, if I say, okay, based on brain, uh, neuroscience findings, we will predict that this happens or that this is relevant. What I need to link to education are the education findings, stating, hey, there is an, I don't know, concreteness effect, or hey, there's a testing effect, etc. Which, by definition, means that they're not, not unique. Otherwise, I can't make the claims because I don't have the education. Second, is everything I say here beyond dispute? No. We're a science after all, it's pretty young science, and most of the neuroscience is disputed. What I say is one of the dominant views, so but still, I think that's an important thing. And lastly, as I said, it's work in progress. But still, I hope it's useful. Okay, so let's get started. And let's get started first with the neuroscience chart. If you read about neuroscience perspectives on education, it's often either a kind of evolutionary perspective on why we have a brain. That's one way neuroscience evidence is used, loosely used, as we are in the interpretation side of things or basically how the brain works. And I'll shortly describe both. So, the evolutionary perspective is often a perspective of, okay, we are not meant to sit in uh, chairs like this and sit all day. We're meant to run the savannah, explore, um, and interact and use our body. And the most fundamental, like, basically our brain is used or is meant to interact. And that's also true, we like that the bigger your body, the bigger your brain. Uh, and there is, there is uh, for example, there's a little animal that normally explores the sea, and at a certain moment it doesn't move anymore, and the first thing it does is eat their own nervous system. Because you don't need a nervous system without moving. So, and the two uh, fundamentals you had at the time as a, as a human being were either your, your body and the external space, and the interaction between the two. And uh, if, you, uh, if you ask a neuroscientist, at least some neuroscientists, what's the basic coding me mechanism in the brain, it's often spatial. Spatial either on the body or spatial out there. Um, which might also be the basis, for example, of our memory system. Let's return to it in a second. And basically a lot of the learning at the, uh, then just happened by trial and error, just behaviorism, as I said, a lot of stuff is relatable to other theories. Um, and based on that interaction, you uh, acquire new knowledge. And the other thing is that there is a huge emphasis on social dynamics. 
And that's the other reason why uh, many neuroscientists believe our brain is relatively large. So for example, this is the relation between body weight and brain weight. Nice linear relationship. Yes, a blue whale is a bigger brain than we have. Um, but the bigger, uh, the higher you are above this line, the more emphasis, at least that's one of the reasons that's given, the more emphasis there is on social learning or um, uh, social raising of offspring uh, in that species. So for example, so it's also the chimpanzee uh, actually raises their offspring collaboratively, just like we humans do. And basically all you or us as teachers are basically raising offspring together. And keeping track of all the social interactions and understanding each other, that would be one of that might have been one of the driving forces of our relatively large brains. So often the evolutionary perspective is mostly focuses on okay, we should have physical interactions and we have social interactions, and that should be uh, a big part of the foundations of our learning. And then you can, for example, think of trial and error learning or making bodily movements. If you're talking about spatial learning, that could be the, ex the explanation why something like the memory palace works so well, where you remember something based on locations in your room, for example, um, and why children are relatively good in memory or concentration. In and spatial memory is one of the memory skills that doesn't strongly improve over, uh, with age, in contrast to most other memory skills. And then now, slowly, neuroscience findings coming out, showing that something like conceptual memory might actually also be spatial in nature, but then based on similarity spatial relationships. Again, the reason why we're using the game memory to project those relations in the spatial domain. And the biggest, the most important memory region in the hippocampus is also the spatial navigation region. So there might be a link there. Might. Okay, and of course, uh, simple things like uh, emphasizing on uh, uh, social learning, like explanation and mimicry, um, are often part of this, uh, this perspective. Okay. On the other side, we have basically what our brain does. So how does our brain internally work? And the most dominant theory that, there now is uh, both predictive coding and the Bayesian brain, and I'll explain them both. So, the classic view of how the brain works is sort of like this. Um, there's a stimulus coming, for example, a tennis ball. You perceive the, the tennis ball that's sent to your occipital lobe, sent to the front, whoop, and you give a response. Now, many neuroscientists believe this is not strictly true, but in contrast, assume you're on the tennis court and you expect that the tennis ball is coming as you're on the tennis court. So, you send your prediction to the back of your brain, predicting there's a tennis ball coming. Expecting. Next, the tennis ball is coming, but it's just at a slightly different place than you expected. Then the only thing you do is actually code the difference. So you code the difference with the expectation. Predicted it to here, and it's a bit to the left, for example. Or it, it, instead of a tennis ball, it's a golf ball. That's unlikely on a tennis court. <laughs> Uh, and you send the prediction forward, and then send it out. And the reason here would be uh, that you, uh, the reason to do this would be comparable to why we, or how we uh, compress videos. Because what happens if you compress a video is basically it's only going to code the differences. So this is the raw, the raw video, and here it's, uh, it's compressed. And it only is encoding the, the dynamics of the face because that's the part that changes. So if you have a video of uh, just a static image, it can be compressed really small because it is the first image times really often. And if you ever have a lousy connection with Skype, you always sometimes see only the mouth moving, only the eyes, and the rest is a bit static. That's because that's the only thing it's then sending, the compressed signal of those changes. And the idea would be that for the brain, it would be an efficient mechanism that if you can fully predict the world, uh, you can just um, perfectly adapt to everything, and that will be the most efficient way to handle the in incoming information. And all deviations will be extra striking. And based on that, you uh, interpret your world. And then the goal of learning is this, to make this difference, or the prediction error, as small as possible. So you want to understand the world as, as, as good as possible to be able to predict as, good, as well as possible. Um, and for that, you need uh, useful information. And then, um, 
that was the predictive coding part. And this is the Bayesian brain, this is Mr. Bayes. Uh, and this is uh, about uh, pro uh, probabilities. And the idea here is that what the brain does is, you, based on all this incoming information, it basically detects stat statistical similarities and predicts what is coming next, and combines this prediction with what is, what is coming in. So if I predict the tennis ball will be here, and I perceive it to be here, I'm actually going to combine the two percepts to assuming it will be roughly here. Based on, for example, if I have been, say I've been tennising to, um, playing tennis against someone who is really constant, probably a machine, and the ball hits here each time, my prediction will be, it will be here, it will be here, it will be here, it will be here. And then I perceive it here, that I say, yeah, but last time it was always here. So I combine the two to one percent in a minute. Or to give them a bit more concrete example, um, I had it the other day with giving lectures, it was Friday morning, and one of the students asked me, are you, this only works in Dutch, damn, okay. <laughs> Um, are you going to join for Bolland this afternoon? Bolland is going for drinks. Um, I said, no, nah, I could do, and we were talking back and forth. Uh, are we going to go Bolland? And then a certain moment, eh? But we can't do bouldering in the Culture Café, right? So he was saying bouldering, so climbing. And I understood Bolland, drinking. But because it was Friday, my prediction for Bolland was really high. <laughs> And that's of course also true if you, if, if you as a teacher, or as a teacher, try to explain something, they have a certain prediction, and that's what they use to interpret the incoming information. So their prediction is combined with the incoming information to, in the end, perceive it in the way they do. And this, this internal model is built upon all the experience they have, and then it's basically a, a, a huge bulk of connections between uh, all the relations you have, you have seen, all the statistical relations you have seen, uh, and what is good and what is bad. And any new part of information is integrated in this network. And as you, for example, also know from uh, education science, but also uh, partly from neuroscience, um, the more this integrated network is activated, and the more a new piece of information is integrated in the network, uh, the better you remember. Yes. I didn't catch you. Did you say you pay more attention to identifying differences between predicted reality and reality? And relating to students listening, does that mean you should really mess them up and be totally unpredictable? <laughs> it, that's a really good point. Um, and I must, in all honesty, say, um, I mean, maybe the best answer is you need to strike a balance. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, because there's one thing. If you're, if you're too predictable, um, then at a certain moment they don't perceive the small deviations anymore. If you're too unpredictable, they can't detect the string and they can't detect the structure and can't see the statistical irregularities, even well, from this perspective. In an earlier session this morning, we said one of the findings of the research is, is um, repetition and variance. So yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the key things would be make sure that the statistical irregularities which students can detect are the regularities they should pick up and sometimes deviate indeed to make something really striking. And also be aware, so for example, the example with the Vohole and bouldering, that's something in, in, in language settings. Um, if you have to hear a certain pronunciation, then you, for example, can better hear it when you contrast it. One of, my, one of our colleagues in the Donners is working on um, learning pronunciation basically by contrasting pronunciations rather than hearing one. Because if you hear one pronunciation, you're probably just going to uh, interpret it as the pronunciation you expect or you already know. While if you hear two, you can't help but notice the difference. Okay. Um, yeah. So this uh, this uh, bulk of information or this internal model is in your in your in your head, and this is basically what we try to do. For example, in the Mongo project, try to make a model of how this works in your in your in your head and use that to uh, interpret the answers of students and uh, help them learn. But that's still uh, very much work in progress, even more than the story. Okay, so these are the two sides uh, I, I highlight from the neuroscience perspective, which, as I said at the start, is basically an interpretation of findings, quite far away removed from the data still. But it could help us think about how we teach and how we uh, uh, do learning. Okay, now I'm going to connect it to gamification. Um, as gamification says, okay, we 
uh, we know what drives motivation, um, and we know what makes uh, experience engaging, and that should to some uh, degree at least fit with what I just said about what the brain basically is doing really big quotes likes. Okay. Anyone did ever uh, did anyone ever do anything with gamification? Probably. Yeah. Probably, yeah, it's hard to miss some it's a bit you always the cool. Um, so this part I'm gonna tell here is based on a book by Yuka Chao. This is Yuka Chao. Um, this is all his idea. Um, and if you use Google for Autalysis, you'll find the book quite easily, and also his, his website with all the explanations. He is roughly my age, I think, and he spent most of his time playing games until he realized I might do something more useful with my time and with my gaming experience, and now he's one of the most sought-after speakers about gamification. Mostly targeted at the commercial industry. I think he has uh, half a chapter on education in his book, but the ideas also apply more broadly. Um, and I think he did an awesome job on this model. So, also the book is worth reading. Okay, I'll walk you quickly through it. So what he says is, a starting point, um, each game or each gamification experience should have an epic meaning and goal. So a reason to play it, in most computer games it would be saving the princess or being the hero in any other way, um, but it can be anything else. In education it might be, um, I don't know, in, in my courses, understanding one of the last frontiers of science, the brain. It could be an epic meaning and goal. And that's something that triggers you into playing a game or learning a topic. Empowerment of creativity and feedback is being able to choose your own route and learning from the feedback you get. That's partly a trial and error learning we talked about earlier, um, and it's also the relatively big emphasis on creativity these days. Thirdly, social influence. It's all the social aspects of uh, working together, either collaboratively or in competition, or just the social comparison, uh, which, <laughs> make the, which makes an experience uh, engaging. Unpredictability. Um, a lot of games have unpredictability uh, by, for example, using dice, and that, use, that gives a sense of excitement and a sense of automatic prediction of what will happen, what will happen. Um, and that's, for example, you can also use in your lessons. I sometimes do it, okay? Okay, you have to present. And students find that a lot less random than if I just say you have to present, even though it's sort of the same thing. Okay, avoidance is basically doing something or being motivated to do something because you don't want something else to happen. In games, it's often losing lives or have, uh, having to go back to start or something like that. In the school system, it's mostly uh, getting a low grade or failing a course or etc. Um, and uh, this is probably one of the gamification mechanisms where actually quite good at in schools. Okay, scarcity. Uh, anything that's uh, that scarce, people want. That could be either um, uh, an object. With, like in many computer games, so a special object. Could also be time. So for example, making time a, a scarce resource by putting on a timer is something that motivates people into action. And also the concept of happy hours is based on a scarcity principle and motivates you to go to the bar. Okay, ownership is having something personal. Something that's yourself and something that you can tailor either your customized MacBook um, or your uh, uh, customized, uh, I don't know, place or own place in school, or your customized, uh, I don't know, agenda, or phone, or anything, but also your own way to do, for example, an exercise and putting yourself in there. Lastly, uh, accomplishment is your sense of progress that you notice that you move forward. Um, many games do that with, with squares you walk on, or you get points, and this sense of progress also with dull games like Candy Crush, that's what makes you, what keeps you going. Getting better, getting better, woohoo! Um, well, depending on, 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 on type of school and type of uh, teacher, this sense of progress might sometimes be not that clear. I know many courses at university where you just start, don't know how you're doing until the end, and then you fit. And along the way, there's no sense of progress. You don't see that you, be, that, that you make progress. You might know more, but you don't realize that you make progression. Well, the progression is the thing that the thing that motivates you, and that is that can be in points, that can be in a lot of ways. Okay, um, so with this framework, Yukai Chao projects a quite broad overview of what gamification can do, and he makes a, a distinction also between the left and right side, but mostly between the bottom and the top side. As you might have noticed when I uh, read them aloud, 
these three versus these three, these three appear a bit more negative. At least I would rather have accomplishment, meaning, and empowerment in my course than scarcity, avoidance, and unpredictability. He, are, he, however, says, and I think he has a good point there, that these three might be factors that keep, keep your students going in the long run, while these ones uh, ignite them into action directly. So if it's happy hour now, we'll go to the bar now, not in now. If something is, that's the scarcity, if we can lose something, for example, we get a low grade or uh, we lose lives, we'll come into action now. Well, for example, the meaning and the accomplishment is something that keeps you going on the, in the long run. So as he says it, you should mix the two to have a bit of both. And as I also talk with other colleagues who are either gamification trainers or teachers, um, that they often have this as backbone in their course, and when the motivation dwindles, they add a bit of this. They either add a time scarcity by making by saying we have to do this now in half an hour or anything like that to make sure they get into action. Okay. Um, and if you relate this back to it, because as I said, Yukai Chao only does this does this basically for the uh, for industry for commercial purposes. If you relate this to the literature on gamification and education. It are mostly the same points. So, for example, goals slash challenges is about the meaning. Personalization is uh, ownership. Rapid feedback is in the empowerment of creative feedback. Visible status is really the progress. Unlocking content is uh, again the accomplishment, making progress. Uh, freedom of choice, empowerment. Uh, freedom to fail. Uh, that's a big thing in, uh, in in games, and it's often referred to as recoverable loss. In games, you can try something, die, and start again. And again, and again, and again, you can just keep trying. Well, often it's again the trial and error learning, and people just, even really hard games, people just keep trying. While in education, often this option to fail is not really there. Also, disincentivizing you to actually try. Because it's scary to fail. Um, storyline, oh, sorry. Storyline new identities, that's really the, the meaning. A storyline often adds a, a level of meaning to the course. Um, onboarding, that's not really in here. I'll have it in the canvas a bit later. Onboarding is what is used in games to get, to get you to know the rules in computer games. It's often a way to, already within the storyline, you try the controls and you play, the, you play a bit of the game and in that way you learn how the game works. In, in a safe and clear way to, to learn to understand the game. That's onboarding. Uh, and that's also sometimes used in, uh, in, in gamification applications. Time restriction, scarcity, and social engagement is the social influence. So even though he didn't intend it for the education purposes, basically the same things. Okay. Before I integrate the two, any questions about the gamification part? Okay. As I said, work in progress, big disclaimer. Here you go. <coughs> That's also because it's easier to read on the paper than on the slides. <coughs> okay. On the back of the on the back of the canvas you see a bit of explanation of the points. Um, what I'm basically now doing in the paper is uh, is uh, relating all those boxes back to the literature and trying to also motivate the structure of the model. As I said, work in progress. Uh, the, the random characters at the bottom of the back, that was my contact information. <laughs> but the printer apparently didn't agree. Uh, but, uh, so if you're interested, for example, in the paper, you can always drop me an, e an email. Uh, my email address will be at the last slide. Okay. Then I'll just walk you through the canvas. And give mostly just a few explanations how, of examples of how I use it in my course. Of course, I have another, other, a different target audience, mostly first year artificial intelligence students. Uh, but at least it, it could be some inspiration of how you might also use it in your lessons. Um, yeah, that's what we do. So, on the one side, analysis, or gamification, on the other side, 
the part about the brain and as I said, growth of business. And I'm going to start at the left bottom. So now we have trust, trust, safety, and clarity. And um, I try to do it a few ways in my course. In the in the long run, for my courses, there is also always a really warm welcome over the middle. Already, what do you want to learn? And I'm Frank, I also get also really introduce myself as, as a person. Quite often, uh, this sometimes happens by accident in talks, but I sometimes do this on purpose. I just got married, so I show this part. And I basically tell a bit about myself, actually uh, fostering the trust and the, the bond. The other thing, most of my courses, if you walk in at the lectures, there's music playing. Soft music, <coughs> relaxing music, music to make you feel at home. Uh, same for the breaks, or I put a video on or something, to give them the feeling of safety. For clarity, I try, but it's a bit hard. As I said, I only back at university for a bit more than a year um, to make my my rules as clear as possible by having, for example, quick rules, just like you have in board games, um, to make sure they at least understand the rules we're playing with. And as I'll say later on, I try to have as few rules as possible, basically saying, okay, I have a fair use policy. Uh, I only set rules when I need. It's most of the time works. But okay, as I said, I have a different talk now. Okay, action and influence is both the influence on my course and the content, but also the bodily actions. So quite a few exercises actually involve moving around the, the room or moving physical things. So for example, in my Brain for Artificial Intelligence course, students get cards with all the key concepts, 200 in total, uh, per block, per three weeks, and they basically have to sort them. So physical interaction with what they I need to learn. And as I say later, when I come to pattern detection, they have to uh, detect the relations between the concepts. That's basically their task. And they do that by physically moving them in space. Okay, curiosity and predictions. Um, I have quite a few of the neural myths are start of my lectures to just uh, let them predict wrongly. And then I'll tell them the real story. Um, and I often leave huge gaps in their, in their, uh, in their knowledge uh, right from the start, such that they have a need to learn. And for the next iteration of the course, I might actually let them make part of the part of the exam at the start to let them make the predictions fail, and then start from there. And that's of course related to the testing effect, which really does show that basically making tests and being tested is the most effective way to learn, a really high effective way to learn. And that I also try to introduce by letting them make those predictions. Okay, environment and embodiment. A lot of stuff I try to uh, uh, make physical wherever possible. So for brain for ai I have physical cards for the, for the main concepts. I also teach a course on academic and professional skills. And then most, I just made a stack of cards with all the key skills they have to learn. So they can just browse through them. Sometimes they have to sort them. I have this one, I don't have this one. To make it physical. And to have a, uh, a concrete monomic, they also have all, all of clear icons, a clear monomic of the things they have to know and have to uh, be able to do. Um, and sometimes I also I use the environment or try to uh, link it to the environment around. Um, and I see the music at also point. Uh, oh, that's one other thing. For example, the music, I sometimes, I, I have, uh, I don't know, 20 assistants for this course, because I have quite a few students. And then I have students that say, oh, Frank, this really doesn't go well. It's Friday afternoon, he had exams the entire week. This, this doesn't work. And they don't want to work on this and this and this, or that is really lazy. And I said, okay, put on music, this music. Ah, then it works. Basically to activate them, to get the energy of them. And then I'm trying to use external influences to get them to, to in, the, in the right mood again. It doesn't always work, of course. If I try, it's all really easy, but <laughs> still, it's for inspiration. Okay, feedback, incentives, and consequences. Um, basically, the rules I have in my courses are mostly um, point rules. You can get points and compliments for a lot of things. Um, which are also often uh, quite open. So I say, you, if you show me that you, sh that you put effort into this course and learned something, I'm happy to give you points. It could be anything. Here you have some suggestions. And sometimes, for example, for academic and professional skills, I don't have, OK, if you do this and this and this, um, so for example, you, uh, you give feedback on the paper of another student, you get extra points on collaboration. Uh, independence, and writing. 
and I have a quite elaborate for academic and professional skills personal score sheet, the skill sheet, if anyone ever played a role playing game, a skill sheet with all their skills listed and they, they rise on those skills and give each other points on these different skills. And now Alex recently he also applied for a grant to make this into a, a digital uh, version where you basically have an avatar of yourself growing based on those skills and you just can give each other points using the app. Okay, have to see how it works. Um, yeah, okay, let's go on also for the time. Pattern detection and, and, uh, uh, and reflection. As I said, for example, the patterns that they detect in brain, it's all really just out there. They can see it by sorting the cards. And in this way, I try to invite them to really uh, detect those patterns. Uh, personal and social connections. For the personal part, uh, I often leave it up to them. Oh, five minutes, okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I often leave it up to them to put a bit of bit of themselves in their exercises. So, for example, for brain, they have to uh, um, organize all those concept, concepts, and they can do it in any way they want. So they could make a mind map. They could also make a big drawing. And I actually got a uh, yeah, it was not oil painting, but a kind of painting once. Uh, but I also got uh, full websites because I find them. I, for me, the format doesn't matter. I want to see what they can do. And if they have a format they prefer, I'm fine with it. And they start experimenting like, like crazy. Until the, uh, I'll tell that later. And the social connection, uh, all, everything is in groups. But not only that, I also say we're going to crowdsource this course. Course. You have a really thick book. We're going to learn 1,500 concepts in this course and all relations. Um, so everything you make, you're going to make a summary for each block as a team. Each summary will be posted online for everyone to see. So at the end, it should be that you can, can learn this course based on the work of all your fellow students and your own work. So the document you make, the product you make, is also not only for me as teacher, it's also for yourself and for your fellow students. So make it work. Okay, progress. Um, in both my courses you don't get a uh, a second grade, you basically have zero points at the start, you have 100 points at the end, and you just get points along the way. So you always basically know where you start. Don't I run the danger that they don't work anymore after they get uh, reach the pass uh, criteria? I didn't experience that yet, it could happen for the current course I'm running, but I also have negative points, so they not always in the safe zone. But truth be told, I mean, this is an academic and professional skills course, so it helps because, for example, not living up to promises you did to either the mentor or your fellow students is a reason to deduct points because it's a skill of teaching. Okay. Uh, yeah. Intergraphic knowledge. Uh, that is what I, what I talked about earlier. If you see the entire uh, internal model of how all knowledge is connected, what we want is that you connect uh, knowledge they already have with what they're learning, because it helps them to store it better, and also connect it to daily life to give it more relevance. Uh, to, get, to connect it up to new courses that are coming to give the new courses more relevance, and if possible also connect it to uh, different modalities or different ways of processing. Um, and one thing I, for example, often do is related to Netflix series. Uh, because there's quite a bit of neuroscience myths in Netflix, uh, Netflix series, so that's a quite easy inspiration. Also, again, to let them experience a need from, hey, oh, I thought this was true, and it isn't. Um, freedom, yeah, as I said, uh, at least my brain course has, has indeed a fair use policy. Uh, uh, I don't set more rules. Uh, I set only more rules if it's strictly necessary. This is the point system, so you know this is the incentives of the course. I incentivize this, I disincentivize that. And anything else you do, uh, yeah, if it's good, then you get more points. If not, maybe I set the rules in the end. And sometimes it leads to, to weird situations. So I had one instance, I not always tell this in my workshop, but last week, uh, where I said to students, okay, yes, you can do anything for points if you show that you learned something and put effort into it. And I had an example in the, in the, in the lecture of a really well-known neuroscientist shaving her head and drawing the entire brain on her skull, on her skull. Which was for her a way to actually explain where the brain is actually in your skull to the students. And I indeed had a student who did exactly that. 
shaving our heads, making a really clear video of where everything is, and drawing it on a skull. I'm not saying I necessarily wanted that. It was quite a, whoa, what happened here? But okay, I think she was already planning to shave her head, so that makes it a bit better. <laughs> but still. Okay, so crazy things can happen. Um, okay, success, that's the, 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 the feeling of success, the feeling also the feeling of competence, that you can do something and you achieve something. Um, but also, um, for example, at the start of brain, I say to my students, um, <coughs> I'm going to make an extremely hard attempt. And that's not only because I like that, but also because I want you to feel proud at the end of the course what you achieved. Because I'm going to ask quite a few hours of you, it's going to be a hard course, but then I also want you to feel that the time was worthwhile by not insulting you with an easy exam. So it will be really hard. But you will be really awesome when you pass. Okay, and then the last one, also because I have to wrap up. Epic meaning and calling. If you think about Especially computer games, they often start with a really fancy intro, setting the scene of that, you're the, that you have to save a princess, or that you have to be a hero in any other way. But also if you think about books or uh, video, uh, movies, there's often something that sets the meaning, sets the state from the first second, the first minute. And that's also what I do in my lectures. The first 20 or minutes, I think, from my brain course is just stating how freaking awesome it is. You have two last firm frontiers of science, neuroscience and artificial intelligence, and we're going to do this in this course. Woo and that's also the feeling I want them to have. And I quite often refer back to this feeling because that's basically the meaning I can have. And in addition, I have the meaning of how useful it is for the daily, for a later professional career. But I want to feel, let them feel the meaning because that's what will trigger them to do something. Okay, now I really have And then you can combine that. Uh, and the background is some more explanation, all work in progress. And I, and I hope at the end also to put some more uh, references in there, or at least in the digital version. Closing, I, I try to combine neuroeducation and gamification into a sort of combined perspective. I'm not saying this is unique, but I hope it's useful. Uh, and what I, for example, also do in the paper is basically showing, okay, for example, this youth, this these boxes overlap a lot with uh, behaviorism, <coughs> positivism, uh, constructivism, uh, and uh, etc. And, and different motivational theories to try to see where it is actually in relation to other theories. Um, to integrate things instead of saying, yay, we've got a new theory which is totally different for others and this is the best. But actually bringing stuff together. Okay, that was it. Thanks a lot. Make a tiny bit of advertisement. I'm actually having a conference on learning experience design on March 17 in Nijmegen, together with the HKU and the University of Leiden, uh, and it's all about designing learning experiences, uh, also related to the uh, talk today. Excellent.